started here. So uh, thanks all of you for joining us for this uh, first session after lunch. I'm going to talk about prompt engineering, generative AI, and groups, how all those things can work together. My name is Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm a senior solutions engineer at Acquia. And if you ever need to reach out on all the Drupal and social platforms, I go by Manclue. So uh, there was a stat recently from the International Monetary Fund. They did an analysis where they figured that 40% of jobs globally, or 60% of jobs in advanced economies, will be impacted by the growing adoption of AI. So I think the pertinent question is, who does that scare in the room? Anybody concerned for their jobs? All right. So um, this is sort of to paraphrase a meme that I saw recently. In order to replace developers, customers will need to clearly state their requirements. I think we're going to be safe. So. That being said, let's talk about you know some of the ways that, that we can sort of each adopt AI in our Drupal sites to potentially you know mitigate some of the, the potential risks. But to start, I thought we should do a bit of a primer, make sure we all have kind kind of a common understanding of exactly what is artificial intelligence. So uh, there's some terminology here, some of it gets a, a little bit wordy. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on it too much, definitely we'll make the slides available later if people want to sort of pour through it in more detail. Uh, simply put, or well, simply, uh, artificial intelligence is a field in computer science um, that studies intelligent machines <coughs> mimicking human responses or automating sophisticated behavior. So it's really about um, starting to create more and more sophisticated um, sort of, you know, artificial machines to uh, mimic human behavior. Natural language processing uh, is about working with text provided in more of a conversational format, so not sort of like keyword searches, being able to understand the underlying intended meaning and provide a rel relevant response. Uh, machine learning is a subset of AI which allows systems to act without explicit, without explicit instructions by leveraging statistical algorithms to extrapolate existing data to unknown use cases. So all about being able to go from sort of the known uh, situations that it was programmed for uh, to extrapolate that out into sort of new and different uh, situations. And then deep learning is a subset of ML using uh, artificial neural networks, representational learning, I'm not even getting into those, uh, which allows them to develop and leverage their own means of classification. So actually starting to develop its own sort of understanding of the world uh, sort of proactively that way. And then finally, large language model, which is, you know, chat GPT and all of those exciting models that we hear about, is an AI algorithm that uses deep learning techniques to accomplish natural language processing tasks, such as responding to unstructured user prompts, which is probably what a lot of people in the room have already, you know, played around with on chat GPT. LLMs are trained on massive data sets often gathered from the internet, but sometimes using more specialized data, and we'll see an example of that later. So, um, as we start to, to adopt and interact with some of these large language models, what are some ways that we can get the best output from them? So there is this sort of growing field of prompt engineering, which is really about sort of understanding how can we tailor the prompt that we feed into the machine to sort of get the result, best results back. So a lot of times it's about providing structure and maybe some additional information. Um, it can be things like providing some examples. So it could be saying, um, you know, if this is, is input A, this is the expected result back, giving it a few examples and then saying, now here's the new novel input and follow that same pattern to give me what I want. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as just specifying a format in which you want that returned. Here's an example from the Nielsen Norman group where they sort of take an example prompt and sort of break that out into the different elements in terms of, you know, something that's gonna be specific enough to get a uh, very targeted output. As an exercise, I thought it would be fun to ask ChatGPT to write a sonnet about Drupal. Um, I think it did a pretty nice job. Uh, and then just to sort of give a quick example by just adding uh, four words to that prompt to say, mentioning Dries, it's, uh, it completely wrote, rewrote the sonnet, um, which I thought was just kind of interesting. So again, just by making small adjustments, you can get very, very different output from these models. So, uh, we're at a Drupal conference, let's get into how Drupal can adopt uh, some AI technologies. So, the first one that I want to talk about is text generation. Uh, 
I guess some of the, the things that we should be aware of in terms of limitations of text generation in AI is that for me, I find it tends to do a reasonable job on general topics. So if you were to ask it a question like, you know, what is Drupal or, you know, uh, what's the history of AI, it can probably do a credible job of those. But if you start to ask it more uh, for prompts that, that should return sp very specific information, then you run the risk of encountering these hallucinations. So it'll basically just make up facts to make it sound more authoritative. And if you rely on those, I think we've probably all heard anecdotes of, you know, the lawyer who lost his license because he just, you know, took a brief that was written AI by AI, those kinds of things. Uh, that certainly leads into, you know, the ethical considerations of potentially taking something generated by AI using sources that you don't know where those, where, uh, like sort of what data that it ingested to be able to output that. And then if you pass that off as your own, uh, there's definitely ways that that can get you into some hot water. And then as of today, there's still some limitations on the recency of data that it's working with. So last time I heard ChatGPT was around 18 months. So if you're asking about something that happened six months ago, it's probably not going to be able to, to give you much good output on that. So those are, are some of the limitations. And I think that's actually the other side of prompt engineering is really just understanding what are the limitations uh, in terms of what it's going to be able to give you. Uh, t AI text augmentation is to me a much more useful way of using AI in Drupal. So rather than saying, have AI you know, create an article for me, maybe you're gonna get your author to, to write the article, but then have AI you know, suggest a title or suggest some meta tags or summarize it. Uh, a lot of things that I feel like, um, you know, when like a, a Drupal architect yeah, it builds out a content model. They have all these aspirations of like, we can build out these cool teaser views that will til uh, you know, filter things in all of these interesting ways, but it sort of depends on people like actually tagging content or like actually writing uh, summaries as opposed to just truncating them or some of these different things that oftentimes those content creators are just too busy to do. So being able to fill those gaps with AI is actually a really good use of this kind of technology. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of modules that you can use for this. So the first one being OpenAI, it's probably the one, if anybody, anybody use OpenAI module? Yeah, quite a few. So this is definitely the most popular, I would say right now, of the existing AI modules for Drupal. Obviously it works specifically with uh, OpenAI and its APIs. It has uh, CK editor options to do things like generate content, change style, and more. It does have a content tool submodule that can do some of those manipulations that we just talked about. One of the things that I think is great about the module is it's super easy to set up. So once you install it, you put in your um, AI key, your yeah, API key from OpenAI, and then you just enable submodules, install submodules for any of the features that you want. Uh, one caveat is that it does require Drupal 10, so if you're still running like Drupal 9, um, this is not gonna be a solution for you. Uh, another one that, that I really like is called Augmenter AI. Um, it actually works with uh, multiple large language models. So uh, if you have needs that go beyond ChatGPT, this can be a good option. It also defines what it calls augmenters as configuration entities. So basically you build out the ways that you want to interact with those models, and that actually becomes part of your site configuration. And you can optionally include some prompt structure elements, and we'll, we'll see an example of that in a couple of minutes. So. Last thing, uh, this also works with Drupal 9, so again, if you haven't yet made the leap to Drupal 10, even though you should, um, this can be an option for you. So let's get into a demo and actually see some of these tools firsthand. So uh, you can see here in the WYSIWYG toolbar, we've got a couple of options, both uh, the OpenAI and the Augmenter module are installed. So let's start with um, the OpenAI version. So it's really like your chat GPT prompt. So we could say, uh, write an article about the Drupal CMS. And you can see it's gonna generate all that text for us. Again, for you know general topics like this, it's probably gonna do uh, a perfectly fine job. Now let's see how the uh, augmenter module is a little bit different. So we could use it for the same kind of, you know, very general things. Uh, so let's go ahead and say, actually, just something very simple. 
CMS, and I've actually set up a couple of those augmenters to, um, to do very specific things. So we could do something like, say, uh, make an article about whatever text I have selected, and we're going to see it's going to go ahead and generate that out. The other thing I'll do is scroll down at the bottom to show for this particular augmenter, I've built into the prompt to say also include citations for any references used. Um, that's actually a tip when you're generating content with AI because it can sort of help to mitigate some of those hallucinations you can end up with. And then it also becomes a fairly easy way if you click through those links and it's sort of like is actually A existing and then B relevant to wherever it was cited, then, then that can help to sort of um, give you an opportunity to at least validate some of the content that's been generated. So uh, in this case, I'm just going to copy this to use later and then also show in this case, I've also set up another augmenter that whatever I pass in as the subject, it's going to generate a Shakespearean sonnet about that. So probably not something that's going to be super practical in day-to-day -day use, but there's lots of different sort of, you know, structures and formats that you could do the same kind of thing for. So let's go back to our article that was written and talk about uh, that idea of sort of augmenting this now. So we could do things like um, if we go in here to the OpenAI module, adjust the tone of voice, summarize, translate, uh, correct HTML, and so on. In this particular module, there's also, I've installed the content tools submodule, which uh, exposes similar kinds of capabilities, but, but puts them in the sidebar. So we could say, you know, analyze if this particular article sort of uh, contravenes any content policies, which, you know, this is pretty um, benign, so no uh, worries there. We could adjust the tone, so let's copy that and say, um, explain it to me like I'm five. And there you have it. It's like having a secret weapon to make your website look professional and cool. Um, so, I mean, obviously, there's lots of different ways. Uh, you might want to make it sound more professional, different things like that. So it uh, can be really useful. Uh, same idea for, you know, summarizing it. Uh, let's actually look at an example of suggesting a title. So one thing you might notice with all of these, it's going to do a pretty nice job of actually generating that content for you. Um, but as of today, it's sort of a manual process for your content author to sort of like, you know, select it, copy and paste it into whatever field they would ultimately put that in. So now contrast that with the way the uh, Augmenter AI module was designed. So when you integrate it into your forms, you actually create new fields where you um, basically build a widget that's going to incorporate a chosen Augmenter and then you have ways to configure how you want it to sort of parse the output. So it, as an example, I've made one here that is going to suggest five different titles and then when you choose one, it automatically puts that directly in the title field. So to me, from a content creator sort of experience, that's way ahead of sort of, you know, expecting them to go to some other place that's down in the sidebar, you know, once they get the result, copy and paste it uh, back in and so on. And it's a, a similar example. We can look at uh, suggesting taxonomy. So we can see here, it's got some suggestions, but if we look at the way the augmenter tags widget works, it does a pretty nice job of actually making these interactive elements so we can say let's just grab a couple of different ones and then as we choose them it's going to put those directly into the tags field so again to me that feels like a much nicer experience for your uh, content authors so uh, the last thing that i wanted to do here is actually go into the augmenters to to give you a bit of a sense of what the configurations can look like for some of these so uh, we've already seen how the article and the sonnet work, uh, but here's an example of how you would structure that prompt. And you can see you're, you're sort of effectively building in some of that prompt engineering as a site builder so that your content authors aren't required to have that same kind of technical knowledge. Um, in the same way, uh, let's go back. Uh, if we look at how the title options 
is structured. In this case, uh, it's got a couple of different messages. So again, you can you can build multiple if uh, you want to do things like provide additional context. That again, that um, some of those richer ideas around prompt engineering. And in this case, we're saying, um, you know, telling the model to provide five different title suggestions, and then uh, within the widget, we're parsing those out to to drop into that uh, drop down widget. So that's hopefully illustrates some of the differences between the uh, OpenAI module and the uh, Augmenter AI. Uh, any questions maybe before we move on? Yes. Uh, so you're configuring your Augmenter things almost like, there are like almost like content fields that you're defining and then do you assign them to different content types or how, does, how do they show up? Yeah, exactly. So if I go into content types article and go um, manage fields, uh, you can see them listed there. There's, in terms of this part of the field configuration, not much to them. Most of what you're going to do here is in the manage form display. So if I open this up for suggest a title, you're going to set sort of uh, where it's taking the uh, text from, where it's going to put it uh, into. If there's more than one response key, then you can sort of change that. But usually the default, in my experience, is good. And then um, you can set, so you again, having those different augmenters defined, you can choose which one you want to use for a particular widget, uh, control sort of the label. In this case, it uses a regex pattern, which everybody loves. And um, you know that becomes a fairly sophisticated way that you can extract out whatever information it is that you want from the, the AI result. All right. Okay, that's, is there another question? Yeah. Uh, do you have a choice in which uh, engine or model to use? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, question for the recording. Thank you. So the question was, do you have a choice on which engine to use? And uh, so, essentially, the the choice on which kind of like large language model, as an example, that you're you're connecting with, that would be part of the augmenter configuration, and then, um, as part of the widget configuration, you choose which augmenter. So that's how you sort of uh, connect those back to whatever large language model you want to provide the result. And how do you know which? Is there some place you can go to understand? Um, so let me just go back here. Ooh. Services. Enter. So this, uh, when you list the augmenters, it, it says which type of, um, which type of augmenter it is, and that basically, you know, is going to tell you which large language model it's for. But you could also develop a naming convention if that would help in terms of that as well. Uh, are there like sub modules or something for each different engine that's supported, or how does that work? They're actually completely separate uh, modules. And then if there was one that you wanted to connect to that didn't have an existing one, then it's not typically a lot of code to be able to do that. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, there's one other Drupal module that I wanted to mention here. Oh, actually, let's let's start with uh, maybe a high level comparison then of OpenAI and Augmenter. So, one Open. Person. Other question? You don't mind. Um, did you do any custom code for that example you just showed, or was that all config within the? Did you have to fix anything? So the the question was, uh, was there any custom code in the previous demo, or was it all configuration? So that was all configuration. Um, I think I ended up playing around with the regex a little bit because, you know, reasons. But uh, yeah, all configuration. So at a high level then, uh, OpenAI, as we talked about, very easy to set up. It does have lots of sub-modules, um, so different capabilities in terms of like if you want to play around with Dolly for image generation or just do queries within the back end, it has lots of different ways to sort of try out all of the different things that OpenAI makes available. Um, also, because it's fairly targeted, I, I do find the maintainers are really good about uh, updating it. So as an example, if OpenAI, I think when they released the um, ChatGPT4 um, APIs, pretty quickly afterwards, OpenAI had uh, had an updated version to reflect that. Uh, Augmenter AI, as we've seen, is, is uh, very configurable. Um, you can support multiple large language models. Um, and um, I like the fact that you can sort of build in the prompt engineering so that it becomes very, very easy for your content creators to, to get some potentially very sophisticated results. 
Uh, one other module we should probably mention uh, is more recent. It's called AI Interpolator. This one really doesn't provide any sort of you know widgets or anything for content creators. It's really meant to be uh, more of a pure backend tool. So you can say, um, you know, as an example, if you were using AI Interpolator in our previous example, you might not even show the tags field to the uh, author and then have that automatically populated uh, once the content was submitted. Um, it does have quite a few different service integrations. I think of all of the AI modules I've looked at, this one is probably the best in terms of like being able to use different um, image services and so on. So um, again, lots of options in terms of finding what best suits your needs. So I mentioned image generation. Let's dive into that next. Um, there are lots of different large language models uh, to be able to generate images. Probably the three that I hear talked about the most are Midjourney, uh, Dolly, which is a service by OpenAI, and Stable Diffusion. Uh, I thought this was a good quote to maybe think about the differences between them. So, Midjourney might produce the best looking images even without sophisticated prompts, but Stable Diffusion will act more consistently and make fewer errors. On the other hand, Dolly is likely to make the most accurate semantic interpretation and interpolation judgments. So uh, another way to think about these, um, Dolly is part of your paid OpenAI plan. So to be able to use this, you're gonna have to shell out probably a minimum of $20 a month, but you know, you're know you also getting ChatGPT and, and other services av available with that. And it does have API access. Uh, Midjourney, you can start off on a free tier. It gives you a certain number of credits, and then once you use those up, you're gonna to have to pay for ongoing use. Um, at this point, all of the access is through Discord, which is, you know, if you don't use Discord otherwise, not super convenient, um, and there is currently no direct API, but I have a feeling those things are in the works. Um, there is also a model called Stable Diffusion, which is open source. Um, there are different websites that you can go to. That, so there's like, uh, I think it's called Dream Source, Hugging Face, um, a few different others. Uh, but you can also download it and run it locally. So it, it runs in Python. Um, sounds like the setup, I haven't actually tried it myself, is, is not for the faint of heart, but um, you know, it definitely can be an option um, if that's something that you want to sort of geek out on. Uh, in terms of how you would structure prompts for images, uh, certainly you're going to want to try and be descriptive about what you want to include. But I have heard there are some cases where, particularly if you don't have a very specific idea of what you want, maybe leaving things a bit more open-ended can also generate some interesting results. Um, you can also add some additional elements like uh, what resolution of output you want, if there's a style or artist that you want to emulate, if there's you know tone or lighting considerations in terms of what you want it to look like. Um, there are also some uh, great outputs I've seen by specifying sort of photograph equi equivalents of things. So like focal length, um, depth of focus, uh, film style, and some of those kinds of things as potentially ways to get a certain look for the image that you generate. Uh, if you want to sort of play around, actually Midjourney on their website has this uh, showcase, which is pretty cool because if you go to any of these images, it will actually show you the prompt that uh, was used to create this particular picture. So you can see in this one, um, there's a little bit around sort of, you know, this uh, futuristic version of Sean O'Pry wearing ragged desert clothes in a contemplative stance. Um, but a lot of the, the remaining uh, parts of the, the prompt are really, again, talking about sort of, uh, you know, photographic equivalents of 35 millimeter macro, FX3, F2.8, and so on. Uh, and then here's the prompt for a very different image where Again, you can see that it's talking about uh, ultra high quality line drawing. We're in surreal white lines and black backgrounds. So um, you can get very different results if you sort of start to develop uh, the capability to, um, to prompt it in the right ways in terms of getting the result that you're after. The other thing that you can do, uh, which is interesting, is uh, start to, to use some of these different models together. So. Um, I think it was Ofershal I saw give a lightning talk at uh, Drupal Camp Florida last year about how he uses ChatGPT to generate his mid-journey prompts to get, um, you know, much better output with sort of a low level of effort. I see that um, now that there are sort of specially trained ChatGPT models, there is actually one that somebody's created called this Image Prompt Generator, again specifically designed for mid-journey. 
Um, but I'll maybe at pause for a second, just say this idea of chaining um, is something that, you know, I think we're gonna start to see a lot more sophistication with ChatGPT or like AI models in general. And in particular, starting to actually have AI, AI models do the thinking around how to break things up into sort of individual tasks and then uh, allocate those out to you know different uh, models to to get the end result and uh, as we start to see it able to do more and more of that on its own it's going to be able to take on more and more sophisticated tasks so uh, for ai image generation in drupal i should add uh, ai interpolator to this list um, but uh, the OpenAI Dolly submodule is definitely something you can use. There's also a module called OpenAI Images. And uh, to me, the, the nice thing about this one is that if you get a result that you like, you can save it to your image library, which is something we're gonna see right now. So if we do a prompt, let's say zebra, So this one is fairly simple. Just take a second. Uh, so this is again using the uh, Dolly model. Uh, if we wanted to, uh, actually let's change it up a little, uh, adjust our prompt to say in a studio. Style. So again, passing it a little bit of information in terms of the style that we wanted to use. Uh, not hugely different, but you can see that by you know passing it uh, more information along those lines, you can get very different output. So let's go ahead and save that, just to sort of be able to validate. That's now saved into our media library, and now that can be used you know, articles, whatever else that we want. Also wanted to sort of quickly show the Dolly submodule for OpenAI, so we could put the same prompt in. Notice that it has a lot more sort of options in terms of how you want this generated. You can choose which Dolly model you want, uh, what quality, what size, even uh, some style controls here, and then when we save it. Uh, the difference here being that rather than showing it to you directly, uh, what it's going to give us when it uh, completes is actually a link out to where we can access the uh, high-res version of the image. So I'll give it a second. There we go. And now we can see the results. So um, I think it's using a newer version of Dolly, which is why the quality looks uh, so much better. Um, but uh, you know, just interesting to see how those two two tools uh, potentially working or notionally working with the same. Um, AI API uh, give very different results. All right, uh, a couple more topics that I want to cover. So vector search um, being something that I think has the potential to provide much more robust search results uh, within uh, websites like Drupal. So uh, there's a um, definition here. I'm not going to sort of stand here and read it, but again, we'll definitely make these um, available later, but I think that the key idea here is that um, by being able to to use this uh, vectorization of, of you know concepts in text and, and other media, um, it can provide much more relevant results and execute faster. So the way that it does that is, uh, again, by converting things into numbers that sort of represent the meaning uh, across a variety of matrices, and then that makes it able to find things that are a better match, um, again, in a, in a, at a much deeper level. So I've, I've heard an example, people talk about vector search as if you had like a municipal website, you could have it ingest all of the council meeting notes over several years, and then you could provide a prompt to say, you know, give me a list of the meetings that this particular counselor didn't attend and return it to me as a bulleted list. And it'd be able to give you that in, you know, a few seconds. Whereas, you know, you're not really going to be able to do the, the same kind of, you know, sort of deep analytical uh, query using sort of, you know, um, simple keyword matching. Uh, here's a bit of a, a simple version of, of how the vectorization kind of works. So the idea of, in this case, just three dimensions, you know, plotting out some of these different concepts, and then the vectors being how sort of these different things are connected together. 
And then a common example you'll see online is this idea of saying, you know, if you take the concept of king and you, you know, subtract man from it, but add woman, you're effectively flipping the gender. But that idea of, you know, combining different relationships to um, arrive at sort of um, different concepts is really how sort of the, the whole idea of vectorization allows AI models to, to achieve that deeper understanding. In terms of Drupal integrations, there's a variety of search API um, modules that you can use. Um, a lot of these connect to different third-party services, uh, Pinecone probably being one of the, the best known, um, OpenAI embeddings being a sub-module again of the OpenAI module. There is also a module called Search API AI, which works with Pinecone and OpenAI. And finally, for something a little less sophisticated, again, we talked at the beginning about natural language processing, there is a Search API Solar module that will allow you to at least do natural language processing in Solar. So, um, last area that I want to talk about is actually writing code. So, probably a few of us in the room have played around with some of the ways that you can get AI models to write code even for your Drupal website. Um, ChatGPT can do some of that. Again, it may be limited by the recency of Drupal and it has in its sort of core model. But there are at least a couple of different sort of specially trained Drupal modules, this one being by Mike Miles, where you can ask it uh, questions. So I went in and said, you know, create an uphook for me. The thing that I thought was really interesting here was that it actually asked kind of a, a clarifying question and said, this is how I interpret what you're asking me. Does that align with, with what you're expecting? And then once I validated that, it actually went through the process of generating code, had an explanation of why it had done what it, why it had done what it did, and then also had some suggestions in, in terms of like how the overall module could be stru structured, other classes I might implement, and so on. So um, I think particularly in terms of easing the transition for people to, to maybe adopt Drupal and be able to understand how to implement certain things, having these kinds of tools available is gonna be really super useful. So I did also include some resources here in terms of if you uh, want to do some additional reading about some of these topics. So have some things in here around uh, prompt engineering. The, um, there's an excellent article in the bottom left. It's actually not an article, it's a, um, there's a thread in Drupal.org, but that's a specific comment in there where somebody's gone through and done kind of a, a very in-depth summary of all of the different AI modules um, for Drupal and sort of, you know, what areas they uh, cover and so on. Uh, some things in here around vector search and, and some of the things we talked about before in terms of the job market impacts of AI, uh, some things around um, image generation prompts, and then also this one in here about that idea of being starting to chain together different large language models in more and more sophisticated ways. So uh, to wrap things up, uh, hopefully the takeaway is that, you know, if we can all start to, to use some of these AI tools um, to, to be better at our jobs, then that should make us less worried about, you know, AI taking our jobs away. Um, please provide your feedback. It's probably, I'm not sure if the forum is available yet, but at some point uh, before you go. Don't forget there is a contribution day on Friday, so hopefully we'll see you out. And with that, I will open up for any other questions. I don't know if you have the answer or anyone in the room has the answer, but if you start using some of these, like let's say you set up a site for a client and you're hooking them into the OpenAI AI API, like do you, <laughs> just thinking like, do I use my account? Do I have them set up an account? Is there, I mean, that's kind of a, not a super sophisticated question, but it's some, something I immediately thought of, like uh, how you manage that. So the question was, if you're using one of these models work on a client project, um, are there sensitivities around um, where that data is going? Is that yeah, or right just, you know, who's, you know, you, who's account? you have a limit to how much you get to use your account for, right? So you have to set up, you pay for one for your clients, right. or have okay. anyone thought through that, that through yet? Right, so um, the add-on then being, it's really more about like who's, um, who's account, know, whose account yeah. uh, that would be used for. 
I mean, my own perspective would be if you're doing customer work on behalf of like an agency or something like that, then um, at a minimum, you should be able to expense that if you're using it for client work. Um, I would say there's probably a discussion that should happen, uh, at least with your uh, leadership, if not uh, the customer, in terms of making sure that they're comfortable with you using those tools, because um, probably not all will be, but, um, you know, I feel like some customers would be excited that, you know, they're, they're going to be able to say their new website was partially built by AI, so uh, probably case-by-case -case basis. I would say one thing to consider when you have the paid API, it's a private model, not the public model if you're using the chat. So that is one thing to consider, like when you're generating the content and refining it, that's not going and training like the general model that the chat GPT would be doing, but it will be like in your own sandbox. -ish. So for the sake of the recording, I'm gonna paraphrase and say, um, if you're using the private account on ChatGPT, it's, it's, that data is going into your private model as opposed to the publicly accessible one. Uh, I think there was, I know on some of the uh, the image generation ones, like they'll, they'll give you like four examples or whatever. Have you run across any of those image generation ones? Like kind of like, you know, you, I liked how you did the titles where it showed the five and you could pick. Are there any images generation ones you saw where we would give the client like four options to pick instead of just one? So the question was with image generation, um, what are some examples of uh, models that will generate more than one option so you can present that to the client as opposed to just giving them one? So actually, the, the one that we saw earlier, the OpenAI images, there actually is a tab where you can create variations. Um, Midjourney will also do that, where when you create a prompt, by default, it'll give you four, and then you have choices. of You can pick one and say, you know, give me four variations of that one. You can say, uh, maybe upscale that one because I want a bigger version. So there's lots of different options. At Stable Diffusion, I haven't played around with that much. I have to think there's probably something similar, but I can't see for sure. But each one of those models can generate out different results depending on the options that you pass in. Like Midjourney, for instance, if you pass in aspect ratios or like resolutions, it will only generate the one image. Uh, and I saw like, a configuration, like some of those options got passed in. So it's, it's possible it's only asking for one image. So the clarification that was provided is that uh, when you pass in certain information as part of your prompt, it may restrict the model from generating some of those variations for you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Do you know if there is any initiatives uh, when uh, you can, like, say, I want on this page, using, for example, Layout Builder, uh, three columns layout and this type of block there, and uh, ChatGPT will bump create you layout and you just feel that I remember that Dries was talking about that on in Toronto. Um, I know that uh, Microsoft already did that feature in their stack. Is there is any like, initiative or anybody works on that? So the question was, is there any existing AI integration that could build out layouts using something like Layout Builder? So I'm not aware of anything that's sort of as Drupal specific as Layout Builder. I recall hearing about a, um, a third party service that sort of built out uh, layouts kind of more for like scaffolding websites um, that had some AI capabilities. And there was actually at Evolve Drupal in Ottawa, a presentation about how one agency was basically generating demo websites by using ChatGPT to create the overall structure and then putting the result of that into that tool that would sort of create AI-based layouts with content and that way it can be very sort of uh, customer specific. So um, nothing Drupal specific that I'm aware of at this point, but uh, maybe somebody in the room will get inspired and build it for us, so. Uh, yes? Do you know if there are any initiatives to have AI write Drupal documentation since we as a community are so bad at writing it? <laughs> Mm. So the question is, uh, are there any initiatives to auto-generate, or not maybe auto-generate, but have AI generate Drupal documentation since the community um, doesn't seem to have a lot of enthusiasm for it? Um, I wish I did, but I feel like, I mean, when you look at, at some of the ways in which things like the, um, the Drupal model that we saw, the Drupal droid, uh, can explain code, um, maybe that's an avenue to explore for sure. Benji? Sort of a similar question. Could you suggest a prompt 
to read the comments on the tuple.org <laughs> issue and suggest updates that should be made to the summary. So the question was, um, is there a prompt that we could use to effectively automate the work of updating an issue summary when uh, a thread has several hundred comments, as we've all seen multiple times? Um, I don't know of that prompt, but it would be an interesting exercise, and um, it's entirely possible that that would be a much easier way to do it. Although, with that being said, I also feel like having that type of issue as, as a way for people to get their feet wet with contribution is probably not a terrible thing either. So. Uh, yes, of course. I, I wanted to comment on this question. I'm sure the chat GPT can generate you the summary, but somebody need, need, needs to make a decision on this long <coughs> list. Somebody needs to say, decision is that out of the summary, this would cause it. If chat GPT is making this decision, or Drupal person is making this decision, how to update? So the, uh, the comment on the previous question is that um, oftentimes the process of updating the issue summary um, is actually also a process of deciding on you know, which of the potential routes that have been discussed should really be reflected in the ultimate issue summary and that giving AI the power to make those decisions is p potentially a uh, fraught path, let's say. Uh, could you make a prompt that could summarize questions and comments that have it off mic when we talk like that? <laughs> 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 you need a better microphone. Um, you're not going to repeat? Oh. Yeah, the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to see if AI would do it. <laughs> Uh, do, do, what's your current understanding on the legalities of all this? When all this AI and all that first came out, I read a bunch of articles that said if you generate it, it's yours, you quote unquote own it. And now I'm reading articles that say just because you generate it doesn't mean you own it. So what were the, what's your understanding there? So the question was, what are the legal implications of using AI generated content? Because initially, um, and in particular, a lot of the image um, services that you can use will say that as long as you're using a paid plan that you sort of own copyright, but um, it's legally more murky because a lot of them have ingested so much content, not all of which has been released to the public domain. Um, yeah, I, I would say, you know, if you're like, you know, Nestle and you're doing an advertising campaign, we've already seen examples of where companies get in hot water by using AI generated imagery. Um, at the end of the day, if you have the resources to, you know, pay photographers or illustrators or, you know, those good things, I feel like, you know, maybe it's just a good idea to sort of like add to uh, the support of those creative individuals anyway, but, um, you know, anyway, that's... Just want to add on to that, the United States Copyright Office, last I read, does not recognize copyright for um, AI generated content because it is not created by a human, it is not able to be copyrighted. So the image, you know, the zebras and the sombreros could be used on the site, but they are not, you can't own a copyright on it because it was dynamically generated. But you can't have, what's the what's the infamous uh, the monkey? The monkey? The monkey? No. The monkey took a picture? Oh, it has to get a copyright on it? Uh, no, 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 I was talking about, what's the infamous uh, like photo agency that you know, they're, they're infamous for going out, they find something on the web, they claim it as their own, then they sue the original person. That, uh, like Getty Images? Getty or? Images, yeah, yeah, thank you. They're bastards. Yeah. <laughs> All right, before, before we go any further, I feel like I'm, I'm way behind on my uh, recording to the audio. So there was a clarification that uh, US law doesn't recognize copyright on AI-generated images. Uh, so if you were to use that on some kind of a campaign, that it's, it's not, you don't own it in the sense of it being restrictive, so. Um, and then there's a comment that Getty Images is very aggressive about going out and suing people. And so if somehow part of their image ends up in something you're using as part of one of your campaigns, there's potential issues there. Uh, so I got one quick question about um, saying the, the use of AI generated information and like what would you qualify as like best practice if say you're getting information for, like we'll just stick with like the image generation, um, and then you give it to a client and then they use it a little bit more beyond what your 
uh, in what your lobby, I guess the target work that you were supposed to do mm -hmm. um, was used. Like, do you have or do you have any recommendation of best practice to say like this information used or was created with AI? So the question was, if you provide a customer with AI-generated imagery and they decide to go ahead and use that imagery beyond the intended use, um, is there a process to follow, it sounds like, or maybe uh, some recourse in terms of, of them using that? It sounds like once you, you uh, generate that using AI, they, there's no recourse for them to use it beyond the intended use. So as long as it's sufficient resolution, they can use it, but anyone else can use it too. So you know, you definitely want to make sure that they're aware of that, um, because if they, you know, put up posters all over town and people take the same image and do, you know, a bunch of unsavory things with that same image, they may not be happy. So this, this so, maybe should be the last one. Are we at time or okay? So one thing I've, I've heard a bit about in prompt engineering is retrieval augmented generation, where you're feeding information along with your prompts is going to get more domain-specific knowledge put in. Any of the tools you shared, do they employ that, whether it's something as simple as shipping taxonomy terms from your vocabulary or shipping other articles with your prompts? So the, the question was uh, relating to the practice in prompt engineering of providing sort of additional information to provide a better context for the model to uh, provide results. Do any of the tools that we've seen allow for that? So I would certainly say if you think about something like the Augmenter AI where you define that and you can add different things to the prompt, uh, you certainly have the opportunity to do that. It's just it would be fairly you know, narrow. It might even be bordering on single use, but, but maybe if there's, let's say you're working on, well, I don't want to say a law blog, but just as an example, something that's very topic specific, you could provide context so that you know people creating content that, that relates to that topic would at least have some level of additional information that, that might help to create better responses. All right, I think that's time. Thanks, everyone.